Thank you. Okay. So, Jeff, this is going to be fun. Um, You're really good at this. Uh, really good at this. Just wait till the end. You, you may change your perspective. Um, no, but you're, you're really, uh, one thing that really stuck out amongst all the speakers we've ever had, um, I found you are one of the most respected members of the financial community and uh, really respected by your peers. So even before diving into the business, just curious a little bit about Jeff, formative events or maybe influential people that help shape who you are and who you've become. I mean, I, I grew up in the investment business. Uh, my dad struggled while I was in middle school, high school during the 70s. Um, and then, uh, and I would work for him. And he was having me call companies when I was 18 years old. And uh, I remember calling the first company prepaid legal services. They sold prepaid legal services and I'm, it didn't make any sense to me. And so I asked the CEO, why would anybody ever buy that service? And I'm an 18 year old kid and he basically took my head off, you know, like you don't know what you're talking about, you know. So I, I kind of jumped in with two feet and, uh, and then, um, and then I, I was very intentional about, about where I wanted to go work. I wanted to go work for this guy, Peter Lynch. And uh, I tracked him down at a conference. Uh, they weren't out recruiting at Northwestern Fidelity. Um, I followed him into the men's room. <laughs> and uh, my dad had me do all this work on Sally May. You know, this was in the early 80s. Uh, and so I was really well versed in Sally Mae, and I saw that Peter owned it. And while he was at the urinal, we had an exchange about Sally Mae that made me look smart. <laughs> Maybe his defenses were down, I don't know. But, uh, but you know, so uh, there is an intentionality to, to the way I went at it. I wanted, I wanted that mentor. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Dad was not gonna be my mentor, he was too tough on me. Uh, and it's a great business, because for 40 years now, I actually come into work every day and I get paid to learn. Hmm. You know, the CEOs fill me up with industries, the way they're doing the, 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 the way they're, they're you know, where, where they fit in the industry structure and how they're adapting to change. And, um, and I just, that's just, you know, that's a lucky, it's a privilege to do that, hmm. to learn and get paid at the same time. Yeah. Well, um one exploration we're not going to have time for today, but I would have loved to take out the couch is why we can't actually learn anything from our dads. But um, the, you, you did choose the right mentor, uh, Peter Lynch, legendary, and then you had this whole journey from fidelity to bloom to value act. Could you talk a little bit about maybe some of the notable lessons or stories that stood out from your journey um, throughout that process? You know, when I was at, when I was at fidelity, I, I was definitely not as, as smart as most of the room. They were just, I mean, this is Jeff Vinnick. These are, these are really, really, they're up there. But I had, I had some EQ, like I had, I like people. Jeff likes people, but some of the people I work with would rather be in their office, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I took a lot from nine years of fidelity about what works for me. You know, value works for me. I'm not a growth investor, I'm a value investor. You learn that, and then um, I, I did pick up some tricks, you know, from these smart guys. But one thing I had was, I think, the ability to just relate to people really well. And so how do I take that skill set with these other skills I picked up along the way and, and make it work in the investment business so that I have a, an edge? And uh, that's when I decided I needed to leave to, to, to be more concentrated and to work with fewer companies and work with them more closely and try to, try to create an idiosyncratic return uh, ultimately as a shareholder director inside the boardroom, you know, um, usually in partnership with the CEO and the board, sometimes you have to make a change. Um, that'll happen. Yeah. But most of the time, I just want to high five together. I don't want to huff and puff and call the lawyers and do proxy slates or any of that. It's, you know, you got to put the time in, figure out if you have somebody you can work with, a board you can work with, and then, and then, and then, you know, try to move the room. And that, to me, is really fun. It keeps it real. 
So much of the stock market today is not real. It's like computers talking to computers and it's traits and data sets and there's not even a company or a person behind that company. And that makes me sad. Um, it's a bit of a video game. Today, you're talking about. Yeah, today. So that, it has changed and it's gotten harder for guys like me. We just need, I think we need more time to turn around a company and have the markets recognize it because they don't really anticipate. They kind of trade in, on contemporary data sets and performance, but that's a different subject. And we may come back to that. I mean, I, I think what I want to just tap into a little bit is, you know, the EQ that you bring to bear and the involvement with companies at the boardroom table. So you've kind of created, you've been a friendly activist um, as opposed to a hostile one, which I guess we see in the, in the media. Yeah. Um, have you seen that uh, to be a broader evolution within activist investing? And maybe for anybody who's a little bit unfamiliar, if you could just quickly define activist investing a little bit more. And what are some of the other trends that investors should be paying attention to vis-a-vis -vis, uh, activist investing? I don't see, I don't see that. I, I, see, I, I see more and more transactional behavior. I, I, don't, I don't really see the sort of investment I have to make to be uh, brought into the room where they, where they, they, get, they, they know me and they, they trust that I'm not going to come in with a, with a specific agenda. That's like a two-year investment. And then you get into the room, and then you need another, another year to figure it out once you have all the information, which is helpful as an insider. And then by year three or four, you're actually creating the idiosyncratic value. I don't see anybody in the public markets that has that time, time horizon. Mm. You know, I mean, there's a couple old timers. You know, there's Nelson Peltz and, and, and Nelson and Nelson. I mean, there's just <laughs> not, there's not really, it, 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 you know, the hedge fund dynamic, you know, which is where the activists are, are coming from, ha, ha, they have a one year performance yeah. incentive system, maybe two at most. So I, I don't think the interest, people's, I don't think it's, and they also, they also are um, not interested in patiently understanding the business. They have a view. They're going to assert that view, and they're going to get the company sold or split up or whatever it is. And they're trying to take as little business risk as possible. So it's very transactional. And I, I think that's gotten worse, not better. Interesting. Um, so when you, so just for anybody who's not familiar, you were at Value Act for 17 years, is that correct? And I think, 20. oh, 20. Yeah. 20, okay my data wrong. Um, and during that time, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've outperformed the S&P by about a thousand basis points. Yeah, that was, it was really, yes, it, yeah. it, was a, it was a tailwind of value, which has been a headwind for six years, so I know that I'm not that smart. Um, it also was, yeah, so we, I think net of fees, we did 15 versus five. We timed it well, yeah. because the, the NASDAQ bubble was bursting right as I was uh, getting started. But we also had a really rich opportunity because when you think about governance in 2000, it was like the CEO and his buddies. Yeah. And uh, cost structures were fat, balance sheets were fat, all that opportunity to share, do sherry purchase and all these other cool things was really rich. Valuations were six times EBITDA, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so for the first 10 years, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Hmm. Yeah, I felt like that. But regardless, it didn't all happen by luck. So, um, you know, you're highly successful at Value Act, and then you leave to go focus on social investing. What drove that conviction? What drives your conviction in the space? Trying to reverse the harm that I'd done for the fi prior 15 <laughs> years. I mean, when you sit in a boardroom, I just didn't know any better. You know, we, you didn't talk. You, for 15 years, I was in boardrooms, and there was not one time we talked about the health of the workforce, really the health of the customer, or, or, or the environment, or, you know, the health of, of our effect on nature and, and the environment. Um, it was a profit-maximizing exercise uh, at the expense of most of those other constituents. Uh, we had this election in 2016 where it was clear a lot of people felt left behind, it was symptomatic. Uh, 
I have, a, I've been married for a long time. I have, my, I, my kids were leaving the house. I was like, how, what are we going to talk about at dinner? <laughs> because she doesn't care about Microsoft, you know? Uh, so I was, so I said, I said, told my wife, give me all your books, you know, your books on animal welfare and conservation and the sixth extinction, you know, climate change. Uh, and I did that in 2016. I read all those books and then I said, I think there's a way to, you know, to take your world, Lord, my wife's, your world and, and my skill set and address this, you know, this world that has increasingly uh, only served the shareholder. So we went from no, the shareholder didn't have a voice in 2000. By 2017, the shareholder had the only voice. Hmm. So we need to bring these new voices into the room. And that's what I did with the shareholder, so why don't I bring the, these other voices into the room? Right. And if you consider, you know, the big picture was interest rates were 15% when I got in the business. So material financial capital was scarce, and we had a really big middle class, and nature was free as far as we knew. So these were the abundant resources, and the companies that did really well with financial resources, like General Electric, flourished. Here we were 40 years later, and interest rates were zero, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we had no fresh water in California, and we have uh, a lack of fair pay in the workforce. Hmm. Um, and we have a relatively unhealthy, you know, in America, 40% of America is obese. Like, that's, that's not good stuff in mental health specifically, thanks to Instagram and Twitter, you know? Mm. So, um, uh, so can I take this active skill set and can I invest, have my companies invest more aggressively in the scarce resource, which is not finance. Share repurchases yesterday's news, PEs are high. Not, not, not a lot of value to create. But there is value to create if we start to address these new constraints. And if you invest well behind the constraint, that's where the big return comes from. So that's the next 20 years of returns. Um, I think I'm early on this one, mm -hmm. uh, but it has to be, because these are imperatives. It has to be. And so a lot of what you're describing sounds like ESG, but you've actually called your company, Inclusive Capital, the non-ESG ESG company, or maybe you've, the anti-ESG ESG company. Could you maybe elaborate on what you mean by that and why you refer to it that yeah, way? In 2017, there was like 10 of us that were getting together in Jamie Dimon's office um, to do a white paper on corporate governance. And it was, it was, it was Jamie and, and Warren Buffett and Larry Fink and Weissman from Canadian uh, CPBIB, uh, Tim Armour from Capital, Abby Johnson from Fidelity. And, um, you know, all of these folks, Jamie in particular was like, how do we get this long-term, how do we get the long-term back? Because increasingly shareholders were knocking on doors saying, you know, sell your company, split up. Um, and things were getting more and more short-term. Uh, and uh, I called them in the middle of that project and I said, I don't know what this ESG thing is, but it seems like that's more like a long-term, like it's a, that's an, a way to get the long-term back. And Marty Lipton wrote a paper called The New Paradigm in 2016, which was really well done. Uh, and by 2018, Jamie was head of the BRT, Business Roundtable, and he codified stakeholder capitalism. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was Jamie's way to repurpose ESG. Uh, but that didn't really work. <laughs> it seems like People adopted it without really knowing what it was. It sounded good. Um, I was going to invest intentionally around stakeholder capitalism. That's what I'm doing even today. Because ESG, if it had been more, uh, uh, more branded as stakeholder capitalism and people really committed to it, th that would be progress. From what I can tell, I, I don't think the public investors are willing to make long-term investments or back companies that are making long-term investments that are addressing food materials and energy in a, in a less harmful way, in a decarbonization sort of way. I don't think the time horizon, I don't think we've had the, the event per se that's going to make them really scared. The investors want their money. That's what right. they do. 
Uh, so this is, a, this is a work in process. So maybe it sounds like two things, and I'd love for you to address both of these points. One is it sounds like on the ESG front, we're not having the conversations that need to be had, exactly. or we're not being honest. Maybe you could elaborate on that. And also, if you could give an example, like, you know, talk about ESG. You're on the board of Exxon, right? How does that fit into your strategy? Yep. Could you, if you could question. Have, so what we did really, we, we love this. When, when we feel threatened, we, we tell people to go buy something. You know, Bush did this post 9-11. Buffett did it post GFC. And then we did it again. We said, if, you're, if you really care about climate, you should buy an ESG ETF. You should retweet your, you know, your climate posts. And you should buy an EV. That, and by the way, that makes you climate friendly. Essentially, that's what we did, yeah. um, it, as opposed to say, you know, don't, don't click on that Amazon product you don't really need. Don't eat as much meat. Like, real behavior change, you know? Mm -hmm. Take a burlap bag to the store instead of, you know, walking out with the, with the plastic bags. Like, that, 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 so the idea that you actually have to sacrifice, and you may actually have to pay more if you really care about this stuff, we excused that. We said, no, uh, just buy something, just buy an EV. And, and by the way, it's all Exxon's fault. Hmm. <laughs> right? That's what we did. Yeah. Um, Isn't it? No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that, that's the conversation we haven't had. Yeah. And, the, and the, the real conversation is the, you know, the policymakers, the ENGOs, they had their own, they had their own profit maximizing exercises. They have to villainize to raise money if you're an ENGO, and you have to get elected every two years if you're a politician. And we need policy that is going to make carb the carbon that is emitted from businesses have a price. It has to the externalities of the business have to be in the product price, or else the markets won't switch on, and the politicians won't do that because they they're. they're it's the yellow vest thing. Remember, Macron did that, and the, yeah. they're afraid. And, and so they're just going to kick the can, kick the can, kick the can. So this is a, this is a basic problem where, where I'm really worried we, we aren't capable of solving this, this, this stuff. Hmm. Um, but the one thing that made the most sense to me is if, you're gonna, if you really care about it like I do, the last thing you should do is run away from it and just buy an already clean business. Like, what is it? You should go where the carbon is being emitted and reduce it. Mm. And, and so that, that's why, to me, Exxon makes the most sense as an activist to go push them on um, reducing their emissions and designing products that provide basic energy that also have lower emissions attached to them, because that's an opportunity in the long run. Now, it was really hard when I first joined the board because there was no price signal. There was no carbon price in America, and there was everything that we were talking about doing in terms of capturing carbon and sequestering carbon or, or using bio, you know, uh, plant-based feedstock to make fuels was just more expensive yeah. than the hydrocarbon. Uh, and I, 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 you know, the other silo here is invest the investor class. So there's the ENGOs, there's the politicians in the investor class, and I already told you how short-term the investor class is. They really want share repurchase. They don't want Exxon to make investments that are low return. Hmm. If I had the ability to redeploy the hydrocarbons into the carbon economy, it's actually a better business. Because when I do a sequestration project with you, you pay me for 50 years, you pay me to take your CO2 and put it in the ground. So that's like a 15 revenue multiple. It's not an eight or a six EBITDA multiple. Like that's a great business. Yeah. I just need that to be switched on. And then we'll go. We'll be the. We'll, we'll, you need big balance sheets to do carbon capture because you need a warranty that the CO2 is going to stay in the ground and not leak for 50 years. Little balance sheets can't do that. So Exxon is like a keystone species in decarbonization, and we have the cash flow to do it. When you think about clean energy, you have this prototype to commercialization valley of death. And so the more people put money into climate tech, the more fearful I am that they're going to all run out of money, especially with interest rates higher and, and, and money getting all of a sudden hard to get in the private, private economy. Um, Exxon has the, 
the customer, they have the balance sheet, they have the scientists, they have the project management, they have the geology. Like, we'll take any cool technology you have in direct air capture and we'll commercialize it. So they are so important to actually do this. Hmm. Uh, and what hasn't really happened is, is, is a, a revaluation of the company. But I think, I think if you give us a little more time and we have a $5 billion ca carbon capture business in 2030, that's like, that's like a value enhancer for sure. And the question is, will they wait till 2030 to value it or will I get credit before then, you know? Yeah, yeah I mean, there's a lot of things to dig into there. Um, for starters, a lot of the activity going on and the uh, innovation in decarbonization is happening in the private markets, um, not in the private And perhaps it's because of the time horizon issue that you've uh, alluded to. They're, they're, the startups are being funded in the private markets, but none of them are commercial. They're, they're not decarbonizing. They're prototypes. They're in a lab someplace. Got it. Got it. So you need, you need the large publics to scale is, what, yeah. is effectively what you're saying. Yeah. The other thing is uh, you mentioned something earlier, which is... Um, that the, uh, where, like, where's the leadership on this coming from? I mean, there's only one Jeff Aubin. So is this coming from the executive ranks? Is it coming from the shareholders? Is it coming, like, who is actually pushing this agenda or who needs to push this agenda in order for this to have the highest probability of success? I mean, this, the, all these CEOs care. I'm telling you, they do. Um, they just don't know how fast they can go. And they don't want to get fired. I mean... Emmanuel Macron, who's uh, Emmanuel Faber, who's running um, ISSB today, uh, at the known was fired. Mm -hmm. uh, the Unilever guy was fired because they were they had low margins because they were investing, you know, more aggressively in some of these sustainability metrics. Mm. Uh, so the, there's it's fraught with risk to to increase the price of your. Of, your, of the cost of your product or increase the price to your customer uh, to do something that, uh, that, does, that does less harm. Because that, the system we have right now is wonderful at generating the lowest price, dirtiest product. It's, it's, it's built for that. It's awesome. Hmm. So how, how do you deal with that, where there's costs that need to go up and shareholders that are more short-term how are you, because you're in this business, and obviously the last six years have been challenging for some of your business, how are you thinking about it, and how should investors be thinking about this going forward? I'm a joyful pessimist. <laughs> uh, I'm, really, I'm worried that... Um, uh, I'm, there are some pockets... So policy is really important, and policy is needed. And we're, we, the IRA is a good first step, but we need more. And by the way, Exxon can play a role in that because you know we're going to D.C. and we're we're we're, we're saying you know here's here's a carbon tax dividend plan that we would love for you to do, um, but it's for the politician it scares the crap out of them, right? Yeah. So the but the inspiration is coming from the CEOs, and then the great thing about ESG is that the boardroom changed. People started asking questions about all this stuff. Um, because as recently as 2017, they were not. And, um, and so uh, companies are ready to lead. Uh, we just need some inspiration from, from the long-term investor class. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. And then we could, we could get some help from the ENGOs who might every once in a while say, hey, good job, Exxon. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of, instead of like the opposite, always the opposite. Yeah, interesting. You made a comment right as you came on, uh, I don't remember in what context, around mental health issues being um, as a result of Twitter or now X or uh, yeah. some of the social media yeah. sites. Again, I, I don't know what my kids are up to these days, but um, obviously that's the beneficiary, that's the cause that we're here. Uh, is there an example with an inclusive capital that, because it, it sounded like it's close to your heart, that, uh, that you're addressing uh, yeah. on this front? It's great. It's it is close to my heart. Um, uh, so we are just not doing energy and, and food. We're doing social, uh, which is hard because you know you don't have a carbon price when you're trying to make for a more just society. Mm -hmm. um, that's why climate took off is because there was a unit you could monetize. 
so the social doesn't have that. So we, we're invested in affordable housing, uh, specifically in the UK. Uh, we're invested in workforce education. Um, and we're on the boards of these companies, hmm. and we're changing their business strategy. And I can get into that. Um, the other SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, that we thought about is like, how do you create you know, thriving communities is one of the 17. And it turns out our communities are online. Like, classic civic engagement is really rare all of a sudden, um, which is sad. And so uh, we, we kind of attack the whole online space. Like, where is the healthiest online conversation in the whole where social it? media's place? So we ended up with Reddit. I, I, we just called Reddit to learn about the other companies because they were public, you know, Snapchat. Then when I got the CEO of Reddit on the phone, I was like, whoa, it's human moderated. It's, it's attentional, not intent. It's intentional, not attentional. People have to opt in. Um, there's a downvote. So if the conversation gets nasty, the people get downvoted. Um, and uh, it's, it's not viral. It's going to stay small it, because people go there because they really want to learn about something. Because it's that viral aspect of social media, it's that dopamine hit, it's the attentional gra grabbing, you know, uh, that, that keeps you, that TikTok will queue up videos yeah. and you'll spend three hours and you didn't even know that happened. Um, and that's really bad for young minds. Um, so what I think is happening is that Reddit's becoming a trusted search engine more and more for young people and old people. Uh, and that sh we should be able to monetize that really well because, you know, if you're trying to sell potting soil, you know you have a very engaged community. So r right before we came on here, we were talking a little bit about your extensive board roles. I, like, I, I really think you're like the king of board governance. And, uh, and you've sat on, you know, Fox, uh, 21st Century Fox, and uh, Willis Corporation, and Sarah Lee, and all these impressive... Uh, I'd be interested to hear, first of all, for a lot of people in the room that are on boards, um, what were the most interesting lessons learned? And uh, what's most important for us as capital allocators, as investors, to pay attention to at that board governance level? I mean, you have to just be patient. You can't come in guns blazing. You have to listen rather than lecture. Um, and all that, that, that time is, you know, return, by the way. Like, you have to give up return, frankly, to do this uh, well, um, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the goal ultimately is to not yell and scream at the CEO if the, if the business is struggling, but to get the CEO, through spending a lot of time with him, to adapt your plan as his. Mm. That's beautiful, because it just happens. Um, so that, that's the, but that takes time and it takes patience and you don't necessarily have all the answers at all because you'll get this information, you'll say, that guy's the bad guy. Turns out he's actually a good guy. That, that guy's the, the blocker. Yeah. So you, uh, you, I just don't think people want to put the time in anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty defeatist about the whole thing. I, uh, so I, um, is there anything in terms of the actual, the macro picture that you're paying particular attention to today. Obviously, you go into these companies and you spend way more time understanding the businesses and the leadership and figuring out opportunities. To but what do you factor in from the macro and um, how are you thinking about it? How should investors be thinking about it today? I mean, 10 years of zero interest rates is very treacherous. Um, and the, the combination of the Fed late to the party in raising rates and then the fiscal stimulus, which includes the IRA. It's the opposite of the Inflation Reduction Act. It's an Inflation Enhancing Act because we're trying to put so much capex through an economy that hasn't built anything in 20 years. We sent all our manufacturing to China. So when you try to bring a reshore manufacturing, whether it's a, you know, it's a biofuels plant or it's a battery plant or it's a chip plant, uh, we have no EPC. We have no engineers, we have no labor, and we have no steel, and we have no land. Um, so these things are really, really, really expensive, and it has, that has to be recovered in price, mm -hmm. or else it doesn't get built. Uh, so 
so tremendous fiscal stimulus, tr tremendous inf secular inflation, um, with a whole generation of investors and even CEOs that don't know the truth, that have not seen a cost of money. It's absolute disaster waiting to happen hmm. uh, for long duration assets. Oddly enough, the stock market's rewarding high PE companies, oddly enough. Hmm. But I think that's, that's a knee jerk because the 35 year old investor hasn't really seen high interest rates right. and they haven't really seen inflation. You know, we sent all of our inflation to China basically that we, we sent it to the dirtiest, cheapest labor in the world and it came back at lower and lower prices for a long time. That's gone. So that we are so complacent around the, the level of long-term interest rates and inflation, you cannot believe it. Hmm. You cannot believe it. Um, and you know, I, I get why people hide out in a, a monopoly businesses like Adobe. Um, I get that. Um, it feels good, subscription-based, so forth and so on. Um, but at some point, they're going to have to do the math. Um, you know, what happens to your terminal value when your discount rate goes from four to eight? Hmm. It destroys it. Wow. But maybe we threw out finance altogether. You know, <laughs> I, I've, I publicly have said, you know, finance is done. You know, some, so there's something else going on, but probably not. It'll, probably not. Hmm. Um, we'll have to have a second conversation to talk about the end game. But, um, but that I really, just before we finish this amazing conversation, I really just want to throw a couple rapid fire questions your way. Okay. Right, okay. These are like a little bit of a lightning round. Don't overthink this. Okay. Whatever first comes to mind, 20 seconds or less. You ready for that? Okay. Okay. Favorite book? Grapes of Wrath. Favorite hobby? Skiing. What do your family members make the most fun of you about? The way I eat my peanuts. Peanuts? Yeah. Okay. Care to elaborate? I, well, I, I, you know, if you give me a mixed nuts, I pick them out, and I, <laughs> I don't know. I, they've taken videos of me doing this. I didn't know I looked like that, but it looks really, <laughs> it looks terrible. Okay, wackiest prediction about the future? Um, that we're gonna, there's gonna be a counter, a counter revolution around local and aesthetic rather than global and computer, computer computational. Hmm. Best advice you ever received? Uh, from my dad. You know, whoever you're going to meet with today puts his pants on just like you do. <laughs> uh, and would your 12 year old self think that you're cool? Yeah, I think he would. I think, <laughs> I think my 63 year old self is cooler than my 12 year old self. So <laughs> I don't know why. All right, key to good relationships. Um, uh, you work really hard with each other, like really work at it. Don't take them, don't take anything for granted. Key to a good investor. Uh, take pain really well. <laughs> and key to a good life. Smile a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Hubbin. Hi. <laughs>